I love Southern California. I mean, come on, just step outside today, right? I mean, you can't get more beautiful weather or a more beautiful place than here in Southern California. I have got no desire to go back to the East Coast. I threw my shovel away, and I'm not going back, but I love it out here. But there, but there, are, there is one thing I really hate about Los Angeles. My number one thing, traffic. When I have to go on the 405, I got to pray up because I got to make sure my sanctification can handle <laughs> and I can control my tongue on the 405 because I got to tell you that that will test you. And sometimes on the 101 there, because I, I just, I hate to waste time. So I hate to be stuck waiting in traffic. I don't like waiting in traffic. I don't like waiting in lines at the grocery store. At the, I've literally walked out and not buy, bought something because I just don't want to wait in the lines. I want to wait in lines. And I don't know about you, but do you guys like waiting? It's like sometimes God says, like, hurry up and wait. <laughs> right? Hurry up and wait. And, you know, right now on the biblical calendar... We are in a season of learning how to wait. This is a season of waiting, both in the old as well as in the new. Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 6, this is what we read. It's after the resurrection of, of, of Messiah. This is what we read. So when they had come together, the disciples, they asked him, Lord, will you restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or for seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Basically, what he's saying to them is, it's time for you to wait until you receive power. And this period of after the resurrection, biblically, is known as Sifrat Omer. Can you say that? Sifrat HaOmer. The counting of the Omer. So on the, on the day Yeshua, Jesus, rose from the dead, we shared last week, it was actually the first fruits. And from the time of Passover to Pentecost, there were these 49 days that they were to count an offering, offering to the Lord. And it was a season of waiting on the Lord for Pentecost. And his disciples here were waiting on on the Lord and Yeshua Jesus spent 40 days teaching them about the kingdom and so this season is a season of waiting and it's a season of preparation but the question is why did God want both Israel in the Old Testament after coming out of 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 Egypt and in the New Testament the disciples why did he want them to wait well think about it for a moment we mentioned this last week that after the disciples saw the death of Messiah, how did they feel? Discouraged. They felt hopeless. They're like, man, we gave up our fishing business. We spent three years of our life doing nothing but sitting on his feet from learning from him. And he was the greatest teacher. He was doing miracles. We thought he was the, the Messiah. And we had like, we, we were like, we were, the, we were the board of directors for the Messianic kingdom. We were in on the ground floor. And then all of a sudden, in a moment, he dies, and it seems it's hopeless. We just wasted. We gave up our careers. We left our families. We sacrificed. And this is what it's come to. And part of the reason why he wanted them to wait is because in that time of waiting, he was healing them and restoring their hope. And hope is always rooted in promise. He wanted to renew them and their hope by having them wait for the promise of the Spirit. Because it's impossible to be part of the kingdom or do kingdom work apart from the Spirit of God. John chapter 3, flesh gives birth to what? Flesh. But Spirit gives birth to? Unless a person is what? Born again, they cannot enter the kingdom of God. And this is perfect for this season because this is what God is wanting to do. He wanted them to receive the promised gift of the Spirit and there was great wisdom in having the disciples wait. And I want to explore this morning with you the wisdom of waiting. 
my grandmother was able to escape from Nazi Germany, from Austria, and she got to the UK, she got to London, all my London friends in the back there, <laughs> UK friends, got to London, and she got her first visa, and she had to decide who she was going to save first, her mom and dad, or her brother, her sister, and their newborn baby. And she decided to save her brother first and his wife and the baby because that's generations for the future. She, gave, she gets them the visa. They go to Vichy, France. They secure a, a guide to take them across the Alps. Them and another couple, baby strapped to the back. He doesn't show up. And they decide they are going anyway. They walk all day and all night. They are exhausted. My great aunt Liesl says, I am not going any further. They said, if you don't go, we're leaving you behind because it's too dangerous. There's Nazi border, ski patrol. We can't stay. We got to keep moving. She's like, well, you can go on without me, but I'm not going. And so they decided not to leave her. They decided to wait to spend the night. When they woke up the next morning, they were five feet from walking off a cliff. They came across a Christian monastery that took them in and helped them get safely over the border to freedom, ultimately to London. But see, if they didn't wait, they would have fallen off. And waiting on the Lord brings renewal and refreshment. And this is what we read in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28 through 31. Isaiah 40, 28 through 31. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the heavens and the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. His understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the who? Weary. He increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who what? Wait on the Lord will renew their what? Strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will grow, run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Those who wait on the Lord renew their strength. It's interesting, the word there for, the Hebrew word there is yachal. It can either be translated as renew or, 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 or it can either be translated as hope or wait. Those who hope on the Lord, those who wait on the Lord. Because waiting and hoping go hand in hand. And learning to wait on the Lord cultivates a hope in us that gives us the refresh, the, the refreshment, the strength, the endurance to be able to go the extra distance even when we're weary. It's like when you're going and you're like when I was running my half marathon and I got to one point, I was so tired. I, I didn't realize I wore the wrong type of shorts and I had burns on my legs and I was like, oh, this is painful. I was like raw on my legs. I wanted to quit and give up. But then I saw, oh man, there's just like a few, there's like three more miles to go and you suck it up. I had hope because I knew the finish line was coming. And that's what, like, kind of that idea of hope. When we wait upon him, we get hope because he begins to put everything in perspective for us. There is great wisdom in waiting, and the disciples needed the Holy Spirit because trying to build anything or do anything apart from God's presence will sap and suck the life out of us. If we build it in our own strength, we have to maintain it in our own strength. Brother Wayne loves to talk about that. If you establish it, you have to maintain it. And that's one of the primary reasons why people burn out instead of burning up for the Lord. We're trying to do it in our own strength, in our own wisdom. And we, we can't do that. We need to wait on the Lord and listen to him in order to learn what he wants for us, right? Yeshua only did what? What he saw his father do. He only spoke what he what? Heard his father speak. That's why he was constantly going alone by himself to wait on the Lord to speak, to connect with him, to get the directions and wait upon the Lord. And sometimes we can rush to do things for God and sometimes we just think that being busy will lead to blessing. If I could just be more busy, the blessing will come. If I could just work harder, I don't want to wait. I'm just going to work harder, and I am go I'm a go-getter. I'm going to make it happen. <laughs> Friends, sometimes it doesn't work like that. You know, I remember in college, 
you know, I read this little post that someone put on the wall. Uh, we didn't have Facebook back then, so this is a post was actually on the wall. <laughs> Some of you might be too young to remember that. I read a funny thing. You know you're old when you get, you know, when, when, when getting greetings uh, on a post means you get it in the mail, right? Uh, but the bottom line is, so it said, it said this, it, was, it says, if Satan can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. Busyness will rob us of our blessing, oftentimes. There was a, fam- there was a famous rabbi, and he, had these, he was a teacher, he had many students, he was one, a famous guy, many people sought to study with him, and he had some very eager young students, and, and he, the, the students were upset because every night he would shut down the school, the library, at midnight, and some of the students were like, why don't you want us to study more? We want to study, we, we, we love it, we're passionate about it. And he's like, uh, that's your sin nature. They're like, What? They're like, uh, that's, that's the enemy. He's like, what? Be, the enemy in our sin nature wants us to study more? That doesn't make sense to us. He said, so, he said, well, let me explain. He said, so you'll continue to stay up to all hours of night. Then when you, you will be too exhausted to get up in the morning to worship and pray to the Lord and have your time to connect with him. So it'll all be about your head and what's going to happen to your heart. And in addition to that, how long do you think you are going to be able to keep up not getting sleep, to staying up all night? What's going to happen is you're eventually going to burn yourself out. You're going to get sick. And let me tell you what, the enemy is very patient. He'll allow a short-term gain for a long-term loss. He does. He's patient. So he'll allow you to push yourself thinking you're doing a spiritual thing. You'll get sick. You'll get burnt out. And then you'll have to go weeks or months trying to recover from the sickness and from the burnout. And you'll lose your passion. And then he wins. So friends, I had a professor who was, so, who was a, a, one of the top Greek scholars. He was so into studying Greek in, in, in college that he actually... Damaged his liver because he stayed up so late studying so many times. And he said, sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is get a good night's sleep. (laughs) Just get some rest and wait on the Lord. And I saw a a TED talk this week by Ariana Huffington of the Huffington Post. And she said the number one key to being more creative is getting more sleep. (laughs) She mentioned how she was working so hard And one day in her office, she just passed out from a lack of sleep, hit her head on the desk, and was hospitalized. Knew she had to change her life. And she said, you know what? I'm more productive, more impactful, more creator, better idea. She goes, your next big idea that's going to change the world is just a few more hours of sleep a night away. Right? I mean... We sanctify God by our doing, but sometimes we just sanctify God by our our resting and our waiting on him. Because we can lose our burden. Sometimes less is more. And often it's not doing more, but it's doing things more wisely. Effort does not equal effectiveness. You can spend a lot of effort and not be effective. More time does not mean greater impact. And it's kind of, our lives are kind of like, you know, the heart is at the center of the body. We talk about it's all about the what heart. And when you look at the nature of the heart, the heart what? Expands and contracts. There's season of expansion, but if all you're doing is expanding, what's going to happen to your heart? It's going to explode. And if all you're doing is contracting, what's going to happen to your heart? It's going to shrivel and disappear. So there's a season to expand, there's a season to contract, and there's an ebb and flow and a rhythm to life, and we have to find that rhythm that works for us with the Lord, with our family, for our relationships, because if we're not living in alignment with him and his purposes for us, for our life, then not, what, not only are we out of alignment, what's going to happen is that we begin to live life on the margins. 
When you live life on the margins, the danger is when you push, you know, it's like in a car, when you push the red line, eventually the engine gives out. When you live life on the margins, you don't have the emotional capacity or bandwidth. You don't have the relational capacity or bandwidth. You don't have the spiritual capacity or bandwidth to have any sort of deep relationship. You go and do your thing, and then you're like, okay, I just want to go home, put on a movie, drink a glass of wine, and just no one talk to me. I just want to veg out. You can't have relationship with God or with other people if you're living in a place of exhaustion. Sometimes we have to wait on the Lord and rest in him. And that's what Solomon is speaking about. A time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, dance, a time to cast away stones, a time to gather, to a time to embrace, a time from reframing from embrace. Go down the list. There's a time to expand. There's a time to contract. There's a time to work. There's a time to rest. There's a time to do. There's a time to be. And a time to be social and a time to be alone with God and yourself. And we must give ourselves that space, that room to breathe. You cannot be creative. You cannot be spiritual if you don't have space in your life. But sometimes we're so hurt we're so wounded that our biggest fear is to be alone with ourselves and alone with God. Because that perfect love has not transformed us. Satan can't make you sin, he'll make you busy so you are burned out and it'll suck the life and creativity out of you. There's nothing worse than even being successful and not enjoying it. There's been seasons in my life where I've preached great messages or God was doing great things and I was so thankful to him or I know other pastors and rabbis, but there was no joy in it because there was exhaustion. The gifts were operating, but the joy and the love, the passion for it had diminished because there was not the waiting and the rest. And if, all we're, if we're constantly trying to fill up every free space, every free moment in our life, it's not good. Ephesians 5 says, five, Ephesians 5, 15 through 17. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Redeem the time because the days are evil. It's so interesting. When God brings Israel out of hundreds of years of slavery, you know what the first commandment he gives them? To sanctify the new moon. There, it, biblically, there was, at the new moon, it was biblically, it's a monthly, it's a celebration because a new, it's a picture of God's promise, the moon waxes and wanes. The promise is that when we wane, our lives are like that, things will wane, but then it always renews and comes back to its fullness. But why does God, get, why does the new moon? Because the new moon is about the calendar, when to worship, is based on the moon, Jewish calendar is based on the moon, and the calendar is about time. When Israel was slaves in Egypt, what do slaves have no control or power over? Their time. Slaves don't have a day timer. They, they, they don't make lunch appointments, right? They have no control over their time. Their time is not their own. God is trying to break the slave mentality. Part of breaking the slave mentality is you're not a slave to time. Time does not master you, but you master it. And if we can't master our time, we'll never, and redeem our time, we will never make an impact for the kingdom. So many times, I'm guilty of it. We make excuses. We don't have the time. That's not true. We don't know how to steward our time is the issue. Everyone has the same amount of hours in the day. Some people find time for God and working out and family, and we've got birds flying around here. There you go. Awesome. Awesome. They're liking the word. They were rocking out during the worship. 
But friends, if we don't know how to manage our time and we're under the tyranny of the urgent, we are slaves in Egypt. Redeem the time. Don't just be busy. Most importantly, it's, it's, we got to remember that if God builds it, he will maintain it. And if we learn to wait on him, he will send us the vision as well as the provision. But oftentimes we get patient and we try and come along and we're just going to be like, Lord, we're just going to help a brother out. We're going to give you a hand. Because like Abraham was like, you know, you know, you know, Abba, listen, I know you got lots of people in the world and I'm getting old and my wife, we've been waiting a long time for this child of promise. We're like 199 years old and there's still no baby. So we, we're just thinking we're going to help you out. I got a great, there's this Hagar, she's real, she's real sweet, she's a sweetie, real servant heart. She's been, re, you know, we're, you know. We're going to bring her, and, 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 and I'm going to be with her, and we're just going to we're have a son. I'm going to have a child with her, and, and that, that'll be good. We'll be good. <laughs> Friends, he wouldn't wait. Fools rush in. He doesn't wait. And to this day, there is still conflict that results because he didn't do things in God's order. Now, God has a special promise for Ishmael, and God loves the Arab peoples, and God says princes are going to come to him. But there's strife between the, 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 the brothers because he does not wait on the Lord. Maybe the Lord would have allowed him to take Hagar to have Ishmael. We don't know. But what we do know is he didn't do it in God's timing, and he didn't wait on the Lord. And when we don't wait on him, what happens? We birth things prematurely. If you have a baby before the right time, if it's too early, you risk the life of your child. Some of us are pregnant with a promise, and God has, and we feel like we've been pregnant a long time, and we're like, God, I've been, how long do I got to carry this thing? I just want to have it already. And we're like, we're just going to induce labor. We're going to induce our labor. And it's not a good idea. Because promises that are not born at the right time have a smaller chance of surviving and thriving. And the birth can lead to heartache and heartbreak instead of blessing because we're like, we want it now. Learning to wait upon him in his timing. So waiting teaches us the hope. Waiting teaches us gives us the wisdom and the strength and the rest and the creativity we need to build and to experience God's blessing. But waiting teaches obedience. A basic kingdom principle is that obedience leads to blessing. Adam disbelieved, he disobeyed, and they were dismissed from the Garden of Eden and life and all these sorts of things. The same is true in Israel. Go up and take the land. No, we don't want to go up and take the land. Okay, don't go take the land. You're going to wander. Okay, we want to go take the land. No, don't go. We're going to take the land. And then they, get, they die, you know. They get slaughtered because they didn't wait on God. First they didn't want to go, then they want to go when they're told to wait. Gosh, man, we're still the same today. Because disobedience leads to distance. And so we see this story, and, and David dances before the Lord with all his might before Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to David and said, how the king of Israel gets honor for himself who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of the servants. And David said to Michal, before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me prince over the people. What was his point? Above your fathers. He's just rubbing it in? No, listen. There's one reason why Saul had the kingship stripped from him. What was it? He what? He disobeyed. He did not kill the cattle of the Amalekites. He didn't wipe Haman out, the Amaleks out. And so he disobeyed, and God says, and, he's, and what does he say? He's like, well, you know, I, I didn't want to wait because the people were getting anxious, and I thought they might rebel, and so I offered the sacrifice. And anyway, I did it for the Lord. It wasn't for myself. And what was Samuel's sacrifice? To obey is better than what? Sacrifice. Obey. By the way, that's like a four-letter word in our day. O-B-E-Y. 
God forbid we should say God has commandments and things that he wants us to obey. It's like, you know, the word of God is not advice. The gospel is not good advice. It is good news. And what David was saying is, Michal, you're putting pleasing of people just like your father did. You're making the same mistake your father did. You're more concerned about what people think about you than you are about passion for God and seeking his presence and obeying him. I don't care what his David says. This one thing I seek, to what? Dwell in the house of the Lord forever, right? You know, better is one day in your courts than a thousand. David loved the presence. If we don't learn to wait, waiting teaches us to obey God. It's often one of the greatest acts of obedience is just learning to wait. Teaches us to be a God chaser, not a people pleaser. And the truth of the matter is we'll never have the courage to obey and go against the crowd until we make the decision like David that only God's opinion and perspective matter to us. Sometimes God asks us to do weird things. Things that are not comfortable. It's like the disciples. They, you know, God tells them to do stuff, but they, you know, but they're obedient. Listen, they get put into jail for preaching the gospel. They get beaten, and they're said, we won't beat you or arrest you anymore as long as you don't preach the good news. And they said, well, we're, it's better to obey God than men. And they rejoice that they were countered and worthy to suffer for the Lord. They chose obedience, not even at their own expense. Because waiting on the Lord teaches us to obey and when we are faithful with a little, God will give us more. Because obedience is an aspect of stewardship. And until we steward and obedient with what we have, God is not going to give us more. And sometimes God, when God moves, you know, sometimes we're willing to, we gotta be willing to obey God even when he asks us to do something risky and offensive. And sometimes when God moves and he asks us to do something, we're afraid, we're nervous. What are people gonna think? I don't know. And what if I, you tell me to go to that person and ask for forgiveness and that sick person over there, I don't know. You, I know you want me to pray for them, but what are they gonna think? I, you know, do you want me to tell them about the Lord? I don't know. They're gonna think I'm some religious, fanatic, holy roller, or kooky person. I don't know about that. At my job, you know, they'll persecute me if I stand for Jesus and all this crazy stuff and sometimes what we do is we treat the Holy Spirit like it's our crazy uncle <laughs> or like a crazy aunt like a crazy member of the family he's not or she's not waiting teaches obedience it also teaches dependence John 15 5 Jesus says apart from me you can do what Hey, let me tell you, in the Greek and Hebrew, you know what nothing means? Nothing. nothing. <laughs> His power is perfected in what? Weakness. We can't do it in our own strength and ability. We need to learn on the Lord. And apart from God's help, anything we do will not last. That's why the disciples needed the Spirit. That's why in the upper room... God breathes upon the disciples like he breathed on the first man and woman. It's about new creation, word and spirit, not by might nor by power, but by my. And waiting should leave us wanting. Wanting increases our want and desire for the Lord. It's like, uh, it's, like, it's like a couple that are engaged and they wait to consummate the marriage to the wedding night. This, it's like the longing and the desire is only increased by the waiting. It's like, you know, it's, it, it, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like at Sinai, God has Israel count 50 days to wait, be excited about receiving God's word. You know, it's like when you want to, it's like it makes it special. It increases the desire. And the more you have to wait, the greater the intensity grows. It's like when I tell my kids during the week, they're not allowed to play the iPad or, or Xbox. And by the time the weekend comes, they're like, Dad, we need it. Come on. They're like shaking. They're having like technology withdrawals. They're like, well, you need the iPad. Well, Avi gets up like 530 in the morning. Where's the iPad? 
Where's the remote control? You know, and God made them wait for Mount Sinai because it was a wedding and he wanted them to want his word. And he made them wait on Pentecost because he wanted them to want their spirit, right? It's kind of like, how many of you count, when you were little, you counted down the days to your birthday? Because what? What's coming on your birthday? Presents, right? God's getting you excited. I want the presents, right? And, and so we count down the days for, to the presents, and God gives two of the greatest presents that we count towards from Passover to Pentecost, the Word of God and the Spirit of God, and it's a time where we're waiting. We're saying, God, I want more of your Word. I want more of your Spirit. I want more of your spiritual gifts. I desire them. Yeah. Waiting, Abraham waited, Israel waited hundreds of years in Egypt. Moses waited. Daniel waited. The apostles waited. And let me tell you what. Israel, the Jewish people, after they were expelled from their land, we, we've waited, we waited 1,900 years to get back to our home. And what is the name of Israel's national anthem? It's called what? Hatikva, the hope. The waiting only increased our hope. People laughed that we'd ever get back to our homeland. In fact, uh, Theodore Herzl, who was instrumental in the movement towards it, he was offered Uganda. The, the Jews were offered Uganda. All the Jews of Europe, because of the anti-Semitism, moved to Uganda, and he almost considered it. And then he was like, Uganda, be kidding me. <laughs> just trying. It's my inner Seinfeld. I'm just trying here. But he didn't take no for an answer, and they got it. It's amazing, against all odds, never happened in history. A nation dispersed and comes back to sovereignty. 2,000 years. It's a sign to us that those who wait, like the Jewish people have waited, they got the promise. It took a long time, but, but it came. I read something on the internet. Cardinal Giorgio Salvadori has officially announced that this year's 1,981st anniversary is to be the Vatican's last in regards to waiting for the Lord to return to earth. But he urged his followers to still continue their faith regardless of the fact that they don't believe Jesus is coming back. It's a hoax that people believed. But how many of us feel like that? How many of us feel like that? We've waited so long. We're just going to give up. Friends, the waiting is to create a wanting, a longer, a desire. The waiting is meant to cultivate in us an anticipation and expectation. And we need a greater expectation. And more than anything else, we're to desire the word, we're to desire the spirit, but we're to desire something even more than that. You know, in Jewish thought, one of the 13 principles of faith is this. I believe in perfect faith in the coming of the Messiah. And though he tarries, I will what? Wait for him. I will wait. Jews would sing that in, as they went to their death during the Holocaust. They would sing that even in the midst of seeing six million slaughtered, they say, we believe in Messiah and we wait for him waiting for him even in Auschwitz. And yet we can't be patient. And then there, it's also, it teaches that in the Talmud it says when we stand before the judgment seat of God, the Lord is going to ask us four questions. Did you conduct your business affairs with integrity? Did you devote time to the study of the word and its application? Did you work at having a family and some say it's literal family, be fruitful, multiply. Some say it's a spiritual family. Did you have spiritual sons and daughters? Did you raise up disciples? And what's the final one? Did you wait for, hope for, and long for the coming of the Messiah? That one of the things that we will be asked and judged for, did we have a hope that we, that we waited and waiting for Messiah? And you know what? This is New Testament biblical. This forms the background of what Paul writes in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He says what? I fought the good fight. I have 
He says, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good. Come on, I have finished the good. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is reserved for me a crown of righteousness, but not only for me, but for all those who have what? Long for what? His appearance. For everyone, Paul is saying, that has longed for the appearance of Jesus, the Messiah, there is a special reward, a special crown that is way laid up for them in heaven. This is how his life began. He was taken into the temple. And who was the priest that dedicated? What was his name? Simeon. And why was this man special? Why did he get to hold the Messiah? What does it say about him? Because he longed to see the what? consolation of Israel. He longed for the Messiah. Anna's the same. She longed for the Messiah. Fast the day and night. We want the Messiah. They waited. They hoped. They prayed. And they got to see it. Close with this. My favorite stories. You'll hear me tell it many times. There was a family. A couple that was very happy. After 10 years, they couldn't have children the husband says, I'm gonna, I, I'm, we got to get divorced. I, 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 my life is empty I, without children. So he, he decides to go to the rabbi and says, will you give us a bill of divorce again? And he's like, well, there's no real issues. You love each other. It's this children thing. He said, because you entered into the marriage with joy and celebration, I want you to leave the marriage with joy and celebration and celebrate the years, that, honor the years that you had together. So she prepared a great banquet they were celebrating. He, in the middle of the meal, he was moved. He said, he said, you have been a great wife. I really do love you. It breaks my heart to do this, but I feel I have to do this. It would be irresponsible for not to do this because of all the inheritance that I have to leave and the family name and all this sort of stuff. He says, but you know what? When you leave tonight, whatever is most valuable to you, you can take with you when you go. So the next morning, he, get, he drinks a little bit too much wine. He wakes up the next morning and a little shicker, he drank too much of the fruit of the vine. He wakes up, and he's in this strange house, and he's like, where am I? He's kind of disorientated, and he, 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 he looks around, and he realizes that he is in the house of his, his in-laws. And he calls for his wife, and she comes in. He's like, I don't understand. We agreed. This is our last night. We were going to separate. She said, listen, you said to me, that whatever was most valuable and precious in my sight, I could take with me when I left. And when I looked at all of our possessions, you were the most precious thing. And he began to cry. And he said, I've been a fool. He said, you're enough. He said, even if we never have children, you're enough. I made a grave mistake. Can you ever forgive me? She said, of course, I love you. They went back to the rabbi, told him the news. He ripped up the bill of divorce. They stayed together. He blessed them. And a year later, they had a baby boy. Wow. And this is what the rabbis say, the sages say. They said, if a woman can say to her husband, you are the most precious thing, and he changes his heart, and he goes home with her, how much more if all God's people cry out to him, and say, Lord, the Messiah is the most precious thing to me. If all of God's people longed for the Messiah like that, would not our Heavenly Father surely send him? Mm. Jesus is the desire of the nations. The question is, is he our desire? Is he the number one desire of our heart? Is he the one thing that we seek? Is he the one we love and value and seek above everything else? Or are we, are we so busy? Are we so distracted? Are we so burnt out that we don't have it in us to tarry with him to wait for him, to be with him in such a way that, that, that he experiences us and we experience him. And he wants, and here's the thing, he wants us more than we could ever want him. And it's not because he's needy. It's because he loves us. 
and he's jealous for us and his heart is for us and he died for us and he values us and he believes in us and he wants our desire to even be just, it's not even a fraction of his desire, but he wants us to want him because he knows by wanting him, the world will be changed and we will be changed and he will come and establish his kingdom and that's the best news possible. Amen. Amen. So let's just pray and worship together. Lord, we just worship you. Just say with me, you are the most precious thing. That's the cry of your heart. Just say, Lord, you are the most precious thing. The most precious thing. You are my desire. So, Lord, cultivate that desire in us. Lord, give us that sense of wanting. Give us that sense of expectation. Give us that sense of anticipation. We want you. We believe we are living in days that righteous men and women have longed to see, that we are going to see it. We thank you that your love is sweeping the world, that it's sweeping the Arab world, that it's going to sweep the Jewish world, that it's going to sweep this nation. There is a move of God, and it's rooted in love and it's rooted in affection. It's rooted in goodness and kindness and generosity that models the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. And we say, Lord, we want you at your resurrection. You strip principalities and powers of their dominion and we want to see you take back and get what is rightfully yours until your kingdom extends from all over the earth until everyone says, as it says in scripture, every that, that you gave, you raised, Jesus and gave him the pl- a name above all names that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow every tongue confess on heaven above on earth below that he is the Lord of all Adon Hakol to the Kabul to the glory of God the Father and we will not be satisfied until we see you get your full reward we will not be satisfied until we see you have get a, that every life that belongs to you Every soul that you desire is committed into your hands until all things are foot under your loving feet. So we bless you now. We glorify you and we worship you because you are worthy. Amen? Amen. Woo, let's worship.